Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Dibble Institute's second Wednesday webinar, Continuous Evidence Building Through Small Test of Change, presented by Gregor Thomas, who I will introduce to you in a few minutes. I am Irene Farley, Outreach Specialist with Dibble, and also on the call with us is Rebecca Powell, our master technician behind the wall, and without her, we could not have these webinars. Go, Rebecca. Next slide. Some housekeeping tips for you uh, before we begin. Uh, on, if you should lose audio on your computer, uh, what you can do is call in and access um, access us through your phone and watch us on the computer all at the same time. Uh, we all also um, will be recording this and as we always do. And with that recording, it will be available a few days after our webinar ends. And you can find that recording to look at, at it again or share with any of your colleagues under our or on our online website under free resources. Our archives there include webinars over the past eight years. And you can also look at it by categories. We list if you're just looking for a particular category that interests you. This link will also be sent to you. Well, we do invite you to participate during this webinar, and we will have several poll questions uh, that we will put to you. Rebecca will place the poll question on your screen, and you can select your best choice as an answer. We will have Q&A, and Gregor said he will pause at uh, different uh, sections of his presentation and I'll just uh, be looking at any questions that you've entered on your question uh, box on in your control panel on the right hand side of your screen. I'll give you a second to look for that. You'll have to press questions and have that uh, show that uh, particular place to enter those questions. But we, if we have time left over, we will also get to other, any other questions that have not been asked during uh, any particular section. And if we don't get to them at all uh, that you've asked, uh, we will definitely, Gregor and I, will make sure we answer them through email. So not to worry. Uh, well, let's do a participation practice, if you will. If you are new to our second Wednesday webinars, there is a hand icon on your control panel, and I'd like for you just to click on that if you're new. I'd like to see how many new people we have. Super, super, super. Do we have everybody, I think? Great. Well, welcome to the new people. And um, what I really want to say is our registration for these second Wednesday webinars have grown over the months. And uh, this month, I recognize some of the names on the registration list, but others do look new. So a warm welcome back to the repeaters and also to those new. And may I personally give a big shout out to Go Bucks, welcome to my fellow Ohioans. Couldn't resist that. So glad you could all join us. And also for those new people attending, and maybe as a reminder for those who haven't been with us for a while, I'd like to say a little bit about the origination and work of the Dibble Institute. Next slide, Rebecca. Well, here you see on your screen, Charlie and Helen Dibble. Well, of course, because we're the Dibble Institute, you can imagine uh, Charlie was our founder. 
And when Charlie retired from his aeronautical engineering career, he returned to his hometown of Redlands, California. He spent a lot of time volunteering with youth. Uh, you may know or remember that in the late 80s and early 90s, the divorce rate rose drastically and the families of the youth Charlie served were no exception. Having the mind of an engineer, Charlie searched for solutions as to how to support youth to reach their vision for creating a healthy and stable family. For example, in consulting with two relationship researchers in his search, uh, and these are names that some of you may recognize, he talked with Dr. Howard Markham at the University of Denver and Dr. David Olson, University of Minnesota. In his conversation with them, Charlie learned all about their studies being done with married adult couples and their relationships. Charlie soon realized nothing was being done to provide youth with tools to develop and sustain healthy relationships. So Charlie continued to, uh, to connect or to uh, close the gap that existed for youth which brings us to today. Next slide, Ms. Rebecca. Charlie built a great foundation for us at Dibble to become a national independent nonprofit firmly placed in the youth and young adult relationship skills world. You will see our programs used to address interpersonal violence, mental health, increased graduation rates, employability, life skills, and pregnancy prevention, just to name a few. What we've learned over the years is that relationship skills cross over into the development of all types of human relationships. We are not direct service, a direct service organization, but our sole purpose is to, our focus is to provide tools for you who educate youth in relationship skills. Last year, a conservative estimate of 81,000 students were taught relationship education using our materials in all 50 states and multiple countries. Well, we realized this could not be achieved without the passionate work of organizations such as yours. So a big warm thank you for that. In establishing the Dibble Institute, Charlie made two strategic decisions which are integrated into our core values. That being the Dibble Institute helps young people gain agency in their intimate relationships. And we do that by translating current research into teaching tools, which leads us into our core values. Next slide, please. You can be confident that our materials are based on scientific relationship studies. We work diligent, diligently to keep all versions of our material updated and relative to young people's experiences and behaviors. And we seek the most current scientific studies to do so. When research changes, we update our materials, even with subtle differences. And when it is subtle, we can become more specific and precise in that content. So you will see that there might be uh, various changes from one version to another, but it's all based on science. And I'm sure you too uh, are, they are uh, very interested in be, being effective. And we look forward to uh, anyone who's using our programs to report back on your evaluations and how you're doing and share what works best for you. So good that you are interested in this webinar. That will help you out on your evaluations. Now, the Dibble Institute believes in strong, safe, and healthy families. Next slide. Charlie intrinsically knew and research has borne it out that children are more nurtured and protected when raised in a stable, safe, and healthy family. 
this is not to discount single family homes because single families often present stable, safe, and healthy families. But we realize how difficult it is to raise a child alone. It is hard work. Take it from me, I raised four children as a single parent. We also realize there are just about justifiable reasons to end a relationship, such as physical or emotional abuse. That is best to leave behind. Over 30 to 40 years of research consistent uh, consistency, oh, I'm sorry, over the last 40, 30 to 40, 40 years of research, we learned that youth consistently tell us that a good marriage and family life is extremely important to them. And unfortunately, they report they do not have the skills needed to create the family they desire. We see what we do here at Dibble as uh, is to guide young people to choose the life they want by teaching them skills that translate to relationships with family, friends, and colleagues. I saw on many of your registration answers that you are joining us today to better collect, interpret, and strategize your programs through better data collection and and uh, interpretation. Or maybe you just want to begin to do that. As we at the Dibble Institute depend on current research to be effective, so too we are hopeful you will benefit by today's information. It is now my privilege to introduce our presenter, Gregor Tom uh, Thomas. Uh, let me just give you a uh, He's going to tell you a little bit more about himself, but I want to really um, tell you about the highlights because I'm so impressed by them. Gregor Thomas was the lead data scientist at Partners for Our Children. He analyzed, synthesized, and presented Washington State Child Welfare data system stakeholders as well as to the general public. More recently at Amazon, no less, Gregor worked on advanced predictive and inferential statistical models to measure impact and proactively solve seller problems. And I think this really uh, was very unusual, but uh, he also taught A-level calculus and physics in Tanzania with the Peace Corps and authored and published a textbook while doing that. How many of us can say that we've done that? Physics and calculus? Not me. Gregor holds a bachelor's degree from Harvey Mudd College and a master's from the University of Washington. Oh my gosh, you are one busy and accomplished person, Gregor. Uh, because of that, we really appreciate your sharing your time and expertise with us. So without further ado, I give the mic to you, Gregor. Thank you, thank you, Irene. Thank you, Rebecca, for facilitating this. I'm gonna try and get my video on and share my screen. Uh, can everybody see my? Um, I assume, actually, I guess you you can't talk to me, but Rebecca and Irene, please let me know if you can't see the title slide of my presentation. I am really happy to be here talking to all of you about continuous evidence building through small tests of change. Um, First, I'm going to tell you very briefly a little bit about Project Evident, which is the organization I work for. We are uh, we're a nonprofit. We're quite young. We're just uh, about three and a half years old now. Um, but we believe that uh, um, that there's increasing demands on nonprofits and uh, and uh, public agencies to demonstrate their impact. Um, and historically, the focus on that has been through really expensive, long-term um, evaluations and randomized control trials. And we really uh, like to try to, we say, put um, practitioners in the in the in the driver's seat of evidence building. We um, and this this uh, this talk I'm going to give is going to be a brief overview of one of the ways in which we do that, which is by enabling you to do your own uh, continuous improvement, demonstrate evidence of your program for your programs, and uh, and and uh, build evidence for your programs while making them better. 
um, Project Evident. We offer a variety of services to um, to both uh, funding organizations and and, uh, and nonprofits. Um, lots of theory of change work, technical and assistance capacity support, scenario planning, long-term strategic planning, especially for of what are your goals for learning, what are your goals for data, and what are your goals for evidence, and how uh, can we help you to get there? And uh, we run, we also run talent accelerators, which uh, um, I'm one of the instructors for the talent accelerator, and we often go, we go very deep on on some of these uh, on on some of these areas. Um, so we'd love to hear from you uh, if any of that is of interest to you. Um, today, uh, or we're going to be talking about uh, our, as I said, our um, evidence building uh, from the practitioner perspective. We strongly believe that we need practitioners, program staff at the center of evidence building um, rather than big evaluation firms, um, and that you know funders and policymakers like to see that too. They want to uh, they want to see practitioners that are working uh, to improve their programs and this is our sort of our continuous improvement cycle there's probably a variety maybe you've heard of pdsa this is just another uh our adaptation of that but a way to methodically um innovate and test the innovations to improve your programs to all in the service of improving community outcomes uh, as I, I, I don't know if I need to say anything more about me. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm sort of the, the, <laughs> the, the data guy at Project Evident. I like to help organizations with stuff like this, with statistics um, uh, when I can, and, uh, and lots of data systems work. I, one of the biggest things, I, most common things I do, I should say, is work with an organization to understand where, where their data system is at and how it's helping them and how it could be helping them and, and trying to uh, enable that data system to to better serve them to their goals. But getting into the meat of why we are here, continuous improvement um, uh, is an ongoing deliberate experimentation to make programs more effective. And uh, we've got some poll questions uh, prepared. So if we could um, maybe go through those. Uh, <laughs> I actually don't have the questions in front of me. Uh, oh, there we go. So. So first off, I want to ask all of you, how often does your team look at program data? And by program data, I mean um, anything from your, your outputs and your activities, if you're thinking of sort of a logic model, like how many, how many students or people you're serving, how many, uh, um, what your attendance is, uh, what the, or, but also especially, I, I'm, we always care about outcomes. If you have short-term or long-term outcomes that you are measuring, um, uh, how often how often do you actually look at data with your team? Um, and looks like that poll is open. So seeing results come in, seeing a lot of people. Um, Actually, an impressive amount uh, doing. Oh, that I was going to say an impressive amount doing daily, but it is dropping as I look at it. A fair amount of weekly, about 20% weekly, 45% monthly, which is really common for sort of small to medium-sized programs. Um, that's a really good cadence to be looking at data, and about 20% are are saying less. So thank you for that. Um, and let me go ahead and ask the next poll question, uh, which is. Which of the following do you use data for? Uh, and again, I forgot to get the poll questions in front of me. So needs assessment, there we go, is, um, is sort of on the front end. Needs assessment is typically for uh, when during an intake or even during program development, figuring out what services to offer, um, maybe developing new services or maybe figuring out what services to offer a particular our, uh, participant program monitoring how much you're doing of various things really common to uh, manage performance within your organization program effectiveness actual outcomes are, are you, your program doing what you hope it's uh, doing and then long term uh, of course is is the hard one is you know beyond uh, beyond completion of your program it does it have lasting impact on your community that's of course the lowest step but still at 55 percent impressive audience and we're seeing about 60 percent uh 58 60 percent of people using data for program improvement testing ways to make your program better which is great um and so i hope i hope that this presentation will help you uh improve your improvement process 
Um, lots of very high data use in this audience. Um, that's great. And let's just go ahead and do the my last and final poll question, um, which is, are you familiar with continuous improvement? Now with 60% uh, of people saying that they are already doing uh, some sort of looking at data for improvement, I think you can, uh, <laughs> we'll see a bit of that. So PDSA is I think the most famous uh, continuous improvement method, but there's many. Um, haphazard approach to program improvement. I'm seeing tw about roughly, ooh, creep, we're jumping up actually, 30, 40% of people, which is really common. Um, you know, everybody is wanting to make their programs better. Um, and, uh, and it's easy to try things out. And so I'm gonna focus on methods that can hopefully make your approach less haphazard and more effective. We've got about 18% who have heard of it and 26% who haven't really heard of it at all. So welcome to everyone. I think there's something in this presentation for all of you. So moving on. We're not gonna get into any of the details of why I'm using this program improvement cycle instead of PDSA or any other. There's uh, there's all sorts of uh, different methodologies for program improvement. They are all extremely similar. They're all very good. Um, I, I am not at all dogmatic about this. This is just the variation that seems to work best for us and our clients. But the, the main idea is that you're gonna have some so, sort of process where you, um, I'm going to use our cycle, of course, <laughs> as the example where you develop uh, develop some idea, some possible solution that might help make your program better. You deliberately test it. You look at the results and learn. Um, you uh, you often repeat the test uh, to prove that it is actually working in different contexts that you want it to. Um, and then uh, and then our improved step is to essentially keep doing it. Improve your program by iterating don't just do it once, don't just try one solution, you try a lot of solutions for a lot of different problems and really put the continuous, in the continuous evidence building, continuous improvement. And doing this well, doing this frequently can definitely lead to better outcomes. Um, the, one of the most important things uh, we think is to be very targeted and specific. Take, having a specific issue to address um, is going to let you target your measurement to know that you're effective and really also target your solution and make sure that your solution is um, is aiming uh, to get exactly what you want. Uh, and then we, so we will start by talking about how we target a specific solution and we're going to give, uh, go through some examples of root cause analysis, which is a, a really helpful tool for um, for thinking about from going from the the problem, the issue that you want to address to potential solutions and and a, a method um, excuse me, a methodical approach to root cause analysis uh, can be really important to sort of broaden the um, the set of uh, broaden your mind and and think a little outside the box in terms of the sorts of solutions you can consider, the different angles you can uh, you can tackle a problem for from. Uh, and and then yeah, and then we go through the cycle. I, I do want to uh, sort of draw parallels. Like this is happening everywhere. Um, continuous improvement uh, is has been a huge thing in the nonprofit sector for twenty plus years, and is is I think always becoming more popular. And uh, you know, it was originally developed in manufacturing. It's a huge thing in the corporate world. I, it's uh, I've come across these tools and seen these tools both when I in my in my in my corporate experience when I was at Amazon when literally every little change on the on to the website needed to be rigorously tested to make sure that it was accomplishing the goals that you wanted to to, to have and not uh, not degrade any performance uh, the tech world uses a b testing which is just another form of this um, and and the nonprofit world obviously uh, uh, and, and similar to the manufacturing world, uh, uses PDSA or other cycles that are uh, that are a little different than A-B testing. But the idea is always the same. The goal of this is to be able to make data-informed decisions uh, when, you're, uh, when you're making changes to your program. And 
the this is my sort of summary of how data should inform decisions. You need to be considering the costs of the change. And a lot of people can only think, a lot of people will only think about financial costs. And that is, uh, you know, that is there for sure. But think about all the costs. Think about staff time needed to learn a new process or adapt or getting different areas of your program and different aspects of the solution so that you're not just constantly changing the same thing and people you know get to the point where like oh why we we just did something new on on you know on this uh why are we changing it again already you want to sort of spread your <laughs> spread your improvements around and also opportunity cost if it's if it's something that takes a lot of time what else could you be doing with that time you also want to think about the strength of evidence. How sure are you that the change you're making is a good one and by how much? Um, and that's a, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is uh, um, what you can do and how sure you can be uh, with limited investment in, in statistics, because I'm not going to give anybody a crash course in statistics in a 45 minute webinar. Um, and then also the risks. You know, there are some changes that you can try out once, and if it doesn't work, you can uh, you can just take walk it back, and no harm, no foul, everything's fine. There's other things uh, like uh, that are harder to take back. Maybe uh, maybe it involves a long-term promise to uh, uh, or commitment to somebody. Maybe it involves an investment in a, a new tool or data system or something like that that you're that you you can't just undo. Um, so. So do think about the risks of, of making the change, but also think about the risks of not making a change. Particularly this year, a lot of organizations have been forced to adapt to, um, to COVID um, and you know, perhaps making a, making something that used to be in person virtual is risky, but, <laughs> but in, in, a, in, a, in 2020, there was a much greater risk to not try out some, a virtual option. But wherever you are, the level of evidence required should be appropriate for the costs and risks. If something, when and a lot of what we're going to talk about today is getting a little bit of evidence for low cost, low risk changes, and that is great. That's for if you can identify low cost, low risk changes, a little bit of evidence is all you need to be able to pull the trigger and try something new. So we're going to focus on a lightweight version of that continuous improvement process, um, hoping to make uh, make changes that are effective, that are relatively quick to both to test and to implement, and that are driven by practitioners, driven by program staff and program leads, rather than um, <laughs> rather than big evaluation firms or or or, or leadership uh, top down mandating uh, mandating changes. So this is going to be my first point I want to pause at just to see if there are any questions that uh, that you have so far that uh, I can address for you. There is one question, Gregor. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible to use continuous improvement evidence as evaluation for federal grants? As evaluation for federal grants. Now, the feds. That this is this is actually uh, something that Project Evident is actively um, working on in our policy uh, 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 on our policy arm. I'm not actually an expert on that, um, but generally, no. The feds are set up for <laughs> for long term uh, for long term uh, uh, impact, which really when when. Continuous evidence building works really well um, to go quickly at a short time scale. And we, especially if you have a good theory of change and, and have done research, you know, we feel confident that if you can improve your outputs, your in short term outcomes, uh, that we think it will translate into long term effectiveness. Uh, but that is that is still difficult to measure and uh, and we are actively working <laughs> with uh, with uh, with our contacts in the federal government to to acknowledge and 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 be more accepting of of um, of continuous evidence building. Um, 
rather than rather than just a focus on on long term uh, long term outcomes that have been validated by a randomized control trial. Um, I, I, I one of the slides I cut was sort of contrasting standard um, uh, standard evaluation, traditional evaluation with um, continuous evidence building, continuous evaluation. Um, and one of the big differences is uh, that uh, continuous evidence building isn't uh, it, it's focused on changes. So you'll see it's sort of a delta, a change in impact, but you're not going to actually measure the absolute impact because for that you really do need a, a, a randomized control trial or or a, a or a quasi experimental design. Um, but what we're going to be able to do is say, okay, like we don't. We're not going to tell you how effective your program is today, but we're going to test out a change and see if it makes it better. And we don't know where we're starting, but we know if we're getting better, <laughs> then results are improving. So it's all about sort of climbing up a ladder rather than using a, a measuring tape to, to figure out how high something is. If that makes sense. So uh, as promised, we are going to start by uh, our process for identifying issues and potential solutions. I mentioned this a little bit before. Um, I really can't emphasize this enough. Uh, the more specific you can be about exactly what you're trying to address, the more likely your solution will be effective. The more likely you are to identify a good solution and the more likely your solution is gonna be um, uh, tailored to the problem and be able to, uh, be able to improve that situation. Um, and our one of our favorite approaches is is um, you, many people have probably heard of five whys or there's other um, root cause analysis tools, um, but we like to build a, a sort of a, a root cause analysis diagram based on by using five whys. And so I've got an example here. Um, this was taken from some work with the school district that was working on attendance. Attendance is a <laughs> attendance is a great uh, thing to focus on for root cause, uh, well, sorry, for continuous, continuous improvement in general, because you get um, really, you can get really immediate feedback. Um, uh, it's not a long-term outcome, it's a short-term short -term outcome, but it's, it's also so clearly related to, um, uh, to, to program goals. If you're, I'll, I'll, I'll use the school example for here, but you know that if a student is not in a classroom, they are probably not learning <laughs> class, uh, whatever is being taught in class. And so it's improving attendance is one of the most direct ways to, that you can try to improve uh, student outcomes. And there's such an obviously direct causal link between students showing up in class to students learning. Um, That's a great thing to target. And, but you get that immediate feedback. If you're changing an attendance policy, you're getting, taking attendance every, every class, every day. Um, and that translates really well to most nonprofits with, who are running programs. Whatever measures you have of program participation, whether it's people showing up, people engaging, um, you, you get that immediate feedback and it's a great, um, it's a great uh, metric to try and optimize. Um, because people, if they're not showing up to their program, they're, they're probably not benefiting from your program. So the idea with uh, this uh, root cause analysis is we start with the issue um, and in this school district, uh, which, and this is not an unusual number, students in grades K through five, at, almost 20% of students, more than 20% of students miss at least a month of school over the course of, um, I believe that's over the course of those uh, those five years, six years. Um, but that's a lot of school to miss. Um, and, and then the five whys is an exercise where we just ask why. Um, and hopefully you, you gather a group of people who uh, are familiar with the system, which probably includes program leadership as well as frontline program staff. If, if it's feasible, it's great if you can even include participants in this. I mean, elementary school kids are maybe not the best participants, but you can still ask them, hey, why, why didn't you come last week and see what they have to say? But this can sort of get you, um, get you a level down and, there, and in, in hypotheses. And so maybe elementary school students get sick a lot. Maybe getting to and from school is difficult for younger students, uh, et cetera. I'm not going to read all of these, but, but then but to not stop there. 
So why do elementary school students get sick a lot? Well, there's germ sharing. And maybe you could eventually, you could come up with a potential solution to reduce sickness, uh, um, which I think a lot of people are, again, in 2020, a lot more familiar with now. Maybe you try and do uh, more hand washing. Maybe you have hand sanitizer in the classroom. Uh, why is getting to and from school difficult? Uh, drop off and pick up is hard for working parents. There's no bus service available. So I'm just gonna follow one of these through. Why is drop off and pick up hard for working parents? Well, school starts uh, uh, doesn't line up with parent schedules um, and maybe school starts later. And then eventually, once you're, you're getting deep enough down, you can start to think about very targeted uh, specific solutions. School, school could start earlier. Um, that doesn't sound fun for, for me, but it might work really well for working parents. Or maybe you can have, provide a before school care program. So this is, a, this is a very detailed, very full root cause analysis diagram. And, and where we'll, I, I love to do this exercise and get as complete a picture as possible for one, for one target issue. And you can generate a lot of solutions. And then what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to figure out which solution we're going to try. Um, and so I've got a sort of a slightly more tailored example, um, less filled out, but uh, presumably a lot of you are using uh, the Dibble Institute's wonderful uh, healthy relationships uh, curriculum. And so maybe you want to improve attendance for for healthy relationships class. And why why is I should actually phrase this as attendance? Uh, some students don't attend healthy relationship class. Why? Um, maybe they forget or are unaware of the schedule from your program. Maybe they think it might be boring. Why are they unaware of that? Well, maybe they don't read the reminder emails you send. Um, maybe um, you're announcing it on social media, but the youth are not engaging with your social media account. Um, maybe they perceive that, uh, perceive your communications as boring. So one potential solution could be to try to improve and make the tone of the communications more fun and more engaging. Now, both all of these I want to point out that, how do I go backwards on my slides? I lost my mouse, <laughs> sorry. Um, all of these are um, uh, the solutions, both from the previous slide and this slide, they are ooh, a little bit of lag there, sorry. Um, they're pretty specific, but they're not, they're not quite detailed enough. You know, if I told you um, create an extended day program is my solution, there's still a lot of implementation details. Who's staffing the program? How long does it last? Uh, what do you, what activities do you actually do with those kids? Same with the tone of communications. There's a lot of ways you could think about trying to make the communications more fun and engaging. But this gets you, this gets you the start. And then when we get into the the program improvement cycle, that's when we're going to sort of work out the details of exactly how the solution is going to work. And we're going to both develop a we're going to develop a specific experiment to test a specific solution. So for that, uh, for that Dibble specific example, um, maybe you could try different communications media. You could try posters. You could try email or Facebook or Instagram. Maybe at texting. Um, maybe uh, the communication schedule. Maybe you're getting in touch too little, too much. But for the tone. Um, a few ideas I had, and again, I don't know, well, not again, I haven't said this yet, but I should. I'm not a subject matter expert for the Dibble curriculum for your programs, which is, um, uh, so this, these might be terrible ideas, but um, it's really important to engage the program staff and, and the people who know the specific program, the specific participants really well to come up with good solutions. But so the tone of communications could be more personalized. It could be maybe more fun. Maybe it's shorter. Maybe it just seems like too long. So I decided to, fun sounds like fun to me. So I decided to work this example of like, maybe we could make it more fun. But you might, uh, before, uh, you might have ideas for different ways you could do this. And I really like to use an impact effort matrix to decide what we're gonna try. You can use this actually at a couple stages. This can be used all the way back at um, when you have a list of potential general solutions or when you have sort of specific solutions, uh, more specific details. Um, 
And the idea is that for each solution, you think about, and this is really just guesstimating based on based on your best guess, how how much effort is it to implement? And going back to the, the criteria, is it risky? Does it take, take a lot of staff time? Does it take, is it expensive? Um, it, does it take training? And how much impact do you think it would have? And the more effort and the more impacts, of the, well, really just the more effort something takes, the more evidence the, that you want to, the more rigorous you want your experiments to be. Excuse me. For lightweight, um, for lightweight continuous evidence building, we're going to really focus on low effort, hopefully medium to high impact, maybe even low impact. That's fine too. But um, without doing statistics and in, or getting a lot of data, we can still look focus on low effort, low risk solutions that can have uh, impacts that can still add up. And when you're developing your test and your idea, you have to think about how will you actually know if it works. Um, you're going to need some sort of data to figure out, hey, was this a good idea or not? Um, and you can go back to your root cause analysis. And this is a um, this is one of the benefits of being so specific. Is hopefully you started with a really specific issue, like we want to improve attendance at, uh, at our at our sessions, and then you have a pretty clear way to measure it. Well, you're you're measuring attendance at your sessions anyway, so let's try and do that. Um, if you have it available to you, quantitative data is of course great. Um, uh, if you're tracking attendance uh, every week or every session or wh whatever frequency. Um, uh, that is fantastic, and you can look at changes in the quantitative data, especially good if you can set up a small treatment and control group. Maybe you've got two different sites, maybe you've got two different classes, maybe you've got um, the two different instructors, uh, something that you can do. If, if you can set a treatment and control group, that's great. Um, this is not a large-scale RCT. This is just going to be like, oh, maybe one week, one group tries something different, one group tries something the same, and we see uh, how things change. Even if you don't have quantitative data, even if you do, in both cases, qualitative data is really important. Qualitative data, by which I mean a survey response or just talking to people, that's data too. Um, if you think about uh, this, uh, this communications, you know, let's say I don't have quantitative data or and I can't set up a treatment and control group. I, or maybe I have counts of how many people are coming to sessions, but you know, one week to the next, it varies a lot. So if I try much to change my communications, I don't know if that's if a, if the attendance goes up because of that or because of uh, something else, or maybe attendance goes down because it's the it's the homecoming football game and nobody wants to show up to my <laughs> to my to my session. Um, that's without a treatment and control group. It's hard to to know what's uh, what's due to quantitatively what's due to your um, your experiment, but qualitatively, it's great. You can you can listen to uh, listen to the youth and they're talking. You can talk to the youth. Be like, hey, uh, did you like the new email? We tried to make it more fun. You can uh, you can listen in to see if they're talking about it themselves. If if we're talking about communications, maybe you have a, a email announcement that lets you look at like a click-through rate, which is great too, just to see if there is, are more people reading the email, um, that very direct uh, um, impact that we're, we're trying to optimize, uh, that first step. Not, um, but qual qualitative data is great, and there's lots of ways that you can, you can collect it, and it can be, yeah, range from the formal of like surveys, but I'd really encourage you to just do the informal of does it feel right to to um, to participants and also talk to staff. Staff will often just have a really good sense of yeah that felt good or it seemed something seemed better or not. Um, and you can again for low risk low cost changes it's fine to go on a bit of qualitative data and nothing else. Questions on that part. I've been talking a whole lot, so I'd, uh, I'll <laughs> well, take a... Well, uh, here is one, and I don't know, maybe you'll be covering this later, uh, or maybe you have, and it's relevant to what you've said. How do you gather and present evidence 
that a system really is inefficient and needs to change? I mean that 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 uh, that's a that's a great question, um, and it goes that goes back to a bit of the root cause analysis. Um, efficiency, you know, we if if we're talking about efficiency, we're often talking about the time or the money spent, but especially the time spent on various tasks. So if you think. Um, so a good example, an example of that might be, um, what would good, a good example of that be? Maybe, uh, may, maybe it's, maybe you're a system for taking attendance, uh, maybe instructors or teachers or whoever, uh, you know, they complain that, that the attendance takes too long out of their class each day. Um, and I think you could you could again talk about why maybe maybe they have to use a paper form that then gets uh, input into a, a program and, the, and they hate sort of you know writing it down with pencil and then doing data entry and that's sort of a clear inefficiency. Um, but uh, but if you if you can't if you can't build out the whys, then that's often an indication that it's not really a problem, or at least not a problem that you're going to be able to solve. Other times you build out the whys, and I, I didn't caution on this before, but especially on a, uh, when we think about something like this, you can get into you can get into uh, hypotheses that are incredibly legitimate and accurate, but are just out, so far outside your locus of control that you're not going to be able to impact them. Uh, I've worked with several programs where you you um that are serving um high needs populations and you get into like systemic racism and it's like you know why why are um why are kids uh uh, uh not having paid trouble paying attention in class it's be oh maybe because they're coming uh, in their morning classes they're coming to school hungry why are they coming to school hungry because they don't have uh, have breakfast and and there you know there are solutions for that of like you know you can provide breakfast at school but if you get into like the well why don't they have breakfast because their family is economically challenged why is their family economically challenged because you know centuries of of <laughs> of, of racism built baked into society that's that's sort of you've gone a little off track it's not wrong but you're not going to be able to ad address that root cause of, of systemic racism uh, in America uh, with a, a small change to your program unfortunately uh, for bigger things uh, for for really knowing that there is a difference the change in inefficiency sometimes yeah you do need um, you need need more data you might need uh, you might need quantitative data you might need a control group but uh, but there's also the the perception of of efficiency is important too, and then just how your staff feel. And so, even just asking uh, if 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 it's a staff activity that feels inefficient and the staff don't like it, maybe the what you're actually trying to optimize isn't the efficiency, but your staff's attitude and your staff's uh, uh, towards that. And if you can make the task a little more user friendly, and you can measure that with a you know just a one to five Likert scale, like you know how. How did that feel today? <laughs> Terrible, bad, okay, pretty good, great. You can track changes in your staff's attitude, which may be what really matters in that case. Um, also, uh, qualitative data. Is it mm -hmm. scientific? What if people are just saying things to be nice? That that's people saying things to be nice is definitely a concern. Um, and you have to uh it, it's a it's good if you can gather qualitative data um in in ways that <laughs> this is this takes work and skill and practice but in ways that aren't biasing the response too much um it's great to supplement with quantitative data when you can um but uh but making surveys anonymous uh or or even if you're just talking to people making it being very vulnerable and open like making it clear that you're looking for feedback and that that what they tell you can actually have an impact in the way things go you know it's not like hey i had this idea i thought it was really great i tried it out what did you think it's you know we're trying we're experimenting with a couple different approaches we'd really like to know what you think is best um, you, you'll get you can you can definitely uh, bias your responses by uh, 
making it clear that you're excited about one particular result um, and you don't want to do that you want you want to try to be neutral and and try to and and with that example um, sometimes it can actually be really um, empowering for your participants to feel like they have control um, and and have influence over your program that they're you're listening to them uh, and it when it comes that way, they probably want you to be successful too. At least, uh, <laughs> at least, hopefully, the 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 ones you're asking, um, and and they want the program to work well for them, uh, and and that's that's the that phrasing of like you know we're we're trying out these different ways. What do you think is best? What do you think we should do more of? Uh, is is a good way to do it rather than I tried out this this thing. Do you like it? Do you like it? Um, <laughs> Sorry, that just reminded me of my three-year-old a little bit. All right, I have about 10 minutes, so I am going to move on. So my idea for making communications more fun, maybe you add memes to the email. So you, so the testing, this is actually the, <laughs> the most straightforward part. Hopefully, if you've got a detailed solution, you've thought through sort of the steps you need to do, you decided, oh, we're going to add memes. Maybe you come up with a meme, you put it in an email, you send it out, um, and then you look at your metric and you see what happens. Um, that's a, this one takes some time, but but if you've done the planning, it should be nice and quick. Uh, the, I guess the extra effort, uh, it's not complicated. You're just sort of enacting the plan for the experiment that you made. And then you need to look at what comes back. Um, so if it's quantitative, if it's qualitative, does it seem to work? If yes, that's great. You can decide whether you're ready uh, to like scale it. Does it become a common practice? Um, or is more evidence needed? And I generally, especially if in the absence of, qua of quantitative data, I'd ex really encourage you to not just do a single test, probably do a couple tests if you can in a couple different contexts excuse me, even if it's just repeating the test, uh, uh, you know, maybe with a small variation next week or next month, just to make sure it feels right to the participants and it feels right to the staff um, before you, you sort of really commit to it. If you're not sure, and this is pretty common, like, you know, we did it, we didn't see a big change, sometimes you see, <laughs> sometimes you see a change the opposite way, which is, of course, uh, bad. Um, you can learn a lot from that too. And based on if you're if you're not sure or if you're sure it wasn't good, um, you have a couple choices, which are to try again with uh, with some revisions, with maybe major revisions, or to um, try a completely different approach. Maybe going back to that root cause analysis and coming up with a different solution for uh, uh, or trying a one of the different solutions that you have identified. Um, negative results are good. Um, you can learn as much from negative results as from positive results. You can learn about what's not working and that, if, again, if you are doing this again and again, if you're doing this continuously, uh, a few negative results will help you know what to avoid and, and understand, uh, you know, things that you thought were going to work and didn't work. Uh, you'll, you'll begin to build up, uh, build up experience and instincts for, for what not to try next time. Um, the only the only the negative result is only really negative if you don't learn from it. The prove step is really to sort of verify the results. So promising results on small scale tests should be repeated in a different context. And I'll go back to the um, what the question that asked uh, qualitative data. Is it scientific? It's yeah. I mean, there it's it's not as algorithmic and rules-based as quantitative data is, but where you get the confidence in the results is if you can repeat it with variations, with a different group, with a different, um, uh, with a different, uh, I don't know, in some different context and get, uh, also see the same result. And so, and that that's sort of that empirical testing um, can help give you confidence that it is, um, that things are working. Uh, again, the, the the, I want to. I'll, I'll, I keep saying this, and I'll say it again. The level of evidence that you need, the level of confidence that you need in a solution, does need to depend on that effort and 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 um, and the potential impact. If you've got something that is expensive or risky, test it a lot. Maybe find ways, even if it's a lot of work, to use numerical data. Um, 
get some get the treatment and control group. But if we're if we're talking about something like putting in a meme and an email and hoping that uh, more people uh, read the emails, that's really low risk. Um, and and that's something that it basically you're just trying to try something out and see if it's worth doing more. Um, and and you don't need a lot of evidence for that. Um, uh, and verifying the results can, uh, trying it out in a different context can also help you streamline the process. And so uh, my meme uh, for which I targeted at young adolescents uh, featured Marie Kondo for tidying your house. I my guess is she's not actually that popular with adolescents, and I knew I knew there was like that other meme with the guy in the orange jacket, and I googled that and I was like, oh, it turns out that's Drake. I I've heard of him. I had I had seen this a million times and had no idea that that was Drake, one of the most popular current recording artists. Because I'm a middle aged guy with like a three year old and a three month old. I don't know what's cool with teens at all. So maybe maybe the maybe a uh, a way to refine the idea is to get teens input on the memes. Maybe you have a little contest for people who show up about what meme should go in the next email. Uh, um, and, and, and it can also help you just iron out anything in the process of like, oh yeah, if I'm putting memes in email, then that means we have to come up with a meme every week for the email. And maybe a nice idea to do that is to engage the, uh, the youth in, uh, in, uh, in creating content for themselves and offloading the work onto them. If that works, that's great. Um, I'm really happy about that. And maybe it's even more effective. But so don't settle on your first attempt. Uh, do repeat, make sure it works in a slight variation and, and also take a chance to improve the workflow of what you're trying to roll out. When you've got something successful, you want to adopt it and scale it, whatever that means. For putting memes in email, that might just be like, hey, yeah, we do this now. Um, maybe you need to email the team to be like, hey, we're doing this now. Maybe it's something bigger that uh, actually is a needs a policy change. Maybe you have a manual that this goes in, or maybe you, you need clearance uh, uh, from, from leadership that this is the new way we do things. Uh, maybe you, it actually, maybe you have, you're in an organization that has multiple sites and you like, uh, you had success with this and it's like, hey, um, the, the YMCA East did, uh, had a lot of success with this. Now we need the central and the west locations to be doing it too. And maybe there's an actual rollout strategy to train. Maybe it's a little more complicated. Whatever it is, uh, you've learned a lot about it. So um, it's time to it's time to actually scale it. And it's time. Uh, one of the most important things is to talk about it. Um, talk about it internally um, and share it amongst teams. Um, and that being able to talk about successes will both encourage other teams to experiment as well as um, get kudos for the team that did experiment and make sure there is this positive reinforcement loop of like, hey, we tried something, we learned something, share negative results even, if frame it as a learning. Um, we tried something, we learned something, and we're, we're better for it. And then the improve. The improve is the rinse and repeat. Go back to the beginning. You've you've made us. You've made one small low risk change. You've made probably a small uh, improvement in your program that's having a little impact. To make this really work, we need lots of little things to add up to an actual uh, to actually big improvements. Leverage what you've learned. You don't have to go back and do root cause analysis again because you did a really thorough job the first time. You can just pick another solution off that list, maybe track tackling a different um, sort of why, a different thread through the tree of uh, to um, tackle the problem from a different angle, do another test, figure out what's working, prove it, and scale it. And that's uh, that's how <laughs> that's how continuous improvement really works is by repeating it. Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. Um, and uh, but m most most often, I think you'll get into the habit of getting little little bits, little positive increments, and sort of step by step, you get to uh, it adds up to big improvements. In summary, program staff can drive improvement and sort of my guidelines, be specific about what you want to improve. Um, small scale and low risk improvements do add up to more real improvements. Uh, use root cause analysis, test using whatever data you can. The more data, the better, <laughs> but, but use what you can get. Um, refine ideas and retest, 
talk about it, very important. And then repeat, make sure, make it be continuous. Um, putting practitioners in the driver's seat of building evidence deepens the sense of control and ownership of the programs. It can have sort of trickle down benefit. That's not the best analogy. It can have benefits that that percolate through the program and get, get um, program staff more, more engaged and more involved, more excited about data and, and success of the programs. Um, and really it can help build a, a, a learning culture at your organization. Uh, I definitely, uh, I've got a time for a, probably one more question. Uh, you know, for big, for big, I want to say this has been really targeted for what I perceived this, the audience to be of probably a lot of people who are working without a lot of data support, definitely without a lot of statistical support for bigger things. Uh, I love continuous improvement. I love doing rigorous tests for bigger initiatives that we start small and we scale up and we actually do use um, quantitative data really rigorously. That's great, but you can, but work with what you have and you know, don't take big risks, don't make big bets uh, on, on a little bit of qualitative data, but take small bets and take small risks and I think they'll be rewarded. Thank you very much. You, I will come back for questions. I do want to flash this out. This is me. This is my email. Feel free to get in touch. Um, but lastly, any questions or comments? Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time for that. But um, I, I'm not seeing any other questions put into the question box. So uh, I want to uh, thank you so much, Gregor, for giving us at least I think for many people starting out, some ideas as how to begin and where to begin. And I love the empowerment of the staff to, that they gain ownership because that's what really you're in relationship with your staff and you're empowering them that you're not the main authority if you are the um, project supervisor or manager of the program. So thank you again so much. It's been a pleasure working with you over the last few weeks to get this going. And uh, so I uh, would like to just uh, do some parting comments with you and uh, we'll let you know if we have any other questions on our survey. Well, thank, thank you, you for, you're welcome. Thank you for joining us today. There's a brief survey after the end of this webinar. We are planning our 2021 schedule. So if you have ideas of what more you'd like to see from us, please put that in there. Uh, this webinar will be available three days from now, at least at a minimum. And you may want um, also, uh, I think Gregor said he would, uh, allow the uh, PDF of this program uh, to be available on our follow-up email to you. And finally, uh, next month's webinar will be, uh, well, you can stay in touch at Dibble Institute. I invite you to visit our website. That is really a good place to know more about us. Uh, we're on Facebook, LinkedIn, or you can call us with any questions at all at 800-695-7975. And Rebecca will probably more than likely be answering that phone. You can also text us and subscribe to our monthly newsletter. And finally, Rebecca, our next November second Wednesday webinar, webinar is a trauma-informed approach for youth. And Jen Todd is the project manager. She does great work at the University of Texas Teen Health Program. And she has initiated a trauma-informed approach specifically for youth. So if you're working for youth and concerned about how to work with them who are in trauma, uh, please tune in next month. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you again and have a marvelous rest of the day. Goodbye.